Datage's friends and family, Chad Hagel here. I'm pleased to bring you our new episode format for Datage's. It's our first video episode, and it's exciting. I welcome you to Entrepreneur's Corner, where business and philanthropic leaders ask me questions about their ventures. We're all about advice and mentorship here at Datage's. Entrepreneur's Corner is a win-win-win for everybody, including you. Subscribe to Datages, follow the entrepreneurs, and learn something new. I'm excited to be going on location today in Santa Clarita, California, with Ryan Lawrence, the CEO of Vintage Chariots and Chariots Inc. His innovative retail concept delivers on the lifestyle culture surrounding the automotive and outdoor communities. Let's get to know Ryan and learn more about how he has taken his vision from just an idea to a multi-store omni-channel operation. Ryan, welcome to Datages. Uh, Thank you, Chad. Really excited that you're joining us as our first guest for Entrepreneur's Corner. I want to actually take a pause here, go back and help explain for our, our, our listeners and the Datages, friends and family, how Entrepreneur's Corner even came around. It was actually a discussion you and I had over dinner about right. six weeks ago in Orange County. Yeah. We we're having a lovely dinner, chit chatting, yep. and topic turned as it always does to business. <laughs> yeah. Uh, always down to business, uh, talking about your brand, talking about your company, your venture, everything you're doing. And, and at some point in the discussion, I, it just hit me. I said, Ryan, let's, let's stop. Like, let's sure. pause right here. Yeah. Can, would you be willing to come on air? Uh, and share all of this story with the Datages friends and family and have me be able to share my advice and perspective for your business because I think it might actually have benefit more broadly to a lot of people out there in the friends and family that are building their own businesses and looking for advice and guidance. So I'm really, really happy that you're game and yeah. that you're excited about joining us. And w what was your perspective on that? What made you motivated to be the first Entrepreneur's Corner guinea pig for datages. Well, I think any entrepreneur needs as much help as they can get. So I think an opportunity to share this time with you and chat about the business and get a little bit of your mentorship uh, about your perspective on my business and how we can take steps to uh, improve that and uh, kind of showcase my brand, of course. And what better way to do that than inside one of my stores so that the audience and fellow uh, potential entrepreneurs uh, can really see what it's like to put uh, pen to paper and uh, you know take a vision and and be you know turn that into a reality. Yeah. So I think that was great. I was really excited to just be a part of one the first episode, but also to be a part of such a great experience where you've um, had so many other great guests up to this point and chat about you know their life and and your ability to uh, kind of give uh, advice on on you know their perspective. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. It's been a lot of fun for me and, you know, it's kind of a milestone in the development of, of datages and, sure. and transitioning to a next step, but it's been wonderful all along the way. You and I have known each other for several years now. Yeah. And according to my wife, Nina, you guys have known each other forever. Um, <laughs> when you and I first met, uh, you were literally Beverly Hills cop. Yeah, that's uh, right. And she would tell me stories. We'll get into some of those stories in a minute because sure. I'm sure the friends and family would love to hear <laughs> some some of your uh, greatest stories and escapades from being on the beat. The two questions that I have for you are, uh, you know, one, obviously, it's got to be a problem for you. You must get confused all the time for the original Beverly Hills Cop, Axel Foley, yes. Eddie Murphy. Yeah. I'm sure you get that all the yeah. time. I mean, I don't know if I look like him, but you know, I, I definitely uh, share a lot of similarities. Got the attitude <laughs> and, and yes. sense of humor, yeah. And then, you know, two, can you just kind of share for the friends and family a little bit about what it's like to be on the Beverly Hills Police Department, what that experience was like for you, yeah. and maybe some pretty cool stories from your time there? Of course. Um, well, it's an honor for one uh, to mm -hmm. serve this country in any capacity has really been an honor for, for me personally and my growth. Um, but, you know, I think what I'd like the audience to understand is that people who take themselves from the public life and they go and they they want to become a, a person of uniform there's a lot of um 
you know, pride that comes with it. And we all, everybody in uniform does the job for the reason to help people and yeah. to make this country a better place. So I think I, I hold on to that. And, um, you know, a lot of that is very special to me because I was able to spend my time helping those around me and those yeah. in my community. So, And for sure, I mean, I joke about it a little bit, but there can't trivialize it at all. I mean, you're sure. in some pretty serious situations. I'm sure you're a trained hostage negotiator. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's, I'm sure there's some crazy things that happen in Beverly Hills. Of course. And, uh, you know, I think the first thing that people are uh, uh, likely to say about Beverly Hills is, oh, nothing happens there. You know, they have this vision of Beverly Hills as being this really great place, which it is. Yeah. But there's this expectation or this belief that, you know, crime doesn't exist in Beverly Hills. And that's far from the truth. Yeah. Um, and so in the capacity of how I worked before on patrol and as a hostage negotiator uh, as part of the crisis negotiation team, you learn quickly that there are um, lots of people who need help and people with mental illness and people who live on the streets that uh, come and go throughout the city that um, create problems and um, those problems need to be addressed. And it's uh, someone like myself or the, the folks that I work with, it's our job to connect with those people, communicate with those people, and try to make that community a better place. That's great. And do you have a couple of escapades that you can share? That would, that would be <laughs> I don't know. How, many, how much time do you have? <laughs> um, well, I would say, you know, being that I'm a car guy at heart, yeah. Yeah. my most um, fruitful endeavors were pursuits. Wow. So, the Steve McQueen bullet. Yeah. Real life. Experience. Yes. Yes. Just throw a couple red and blue lights on top and yeah. it's basically the same scene of the movie. Um, but I would say my most enjoyable time there is working with my partner um, in the capacity of, you know, pursuing somebody. It's the excitement that we all potentially signed up for. Yeah. It's, you know, dangerous, of course, on any level. Yeah. But um, the exhilaration and just the rush that you get, the adrenaline rush that comes from doing that specific job uh, is pretty exciting. And so one of the funny stories that I remember is that, you know, I love driving, of course. Mm -hmm. I love cars. And so um, any opportunity to pursue somebody was really just like, you know, the... the <laughs> Game on. <laughs> Game on, absolutely. Yeah. So w there used to be this joke that, you know, I had been in quite a bit of pursuits <laughs> and, you know, one of my fortes, let's call it, would be to pit somebody, get close enough to spin them out. And so there was an, opp an opportunity to do so on a car that was very unlikely to be pit. Uh, we had a stolen uh, uh, smart car. Oh, wow. And that was driven by a female. And um, the pursuit took us outside the city. And being that the car is so small, it's yeah. generally not advised to try to pit a smart car. It could car. just as easily roll that I'm way sure, versus yeah. spin that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I did successfully pit it. And wow. the car didn't tip over. And the, the passenger or the driver of the car was safe in the end. But uh, that was a fond memory. Um, another uh, fond pursuit story would be uh, from a time that I was with my partner. We were in an unmarked car. We didn't have any real, uh, you know, black and white insignias on the car. And uh, I think we had borrowed the car from one of our lieutenants for the day. And it just so happened we got into a pursuit. And so uh, ended up pitting the other car with the unmarked car with no bumper guards, nothing. Very limited damage, I might say. So wow. I think I performed it with, uh, you know, specialty there. And how did the lieutenant feel when he got his car back? Uh, you know, I think he was a little irked at first, but yeah. then they were proud that we uh, stopped the, you know, the suspect. So that's awesome. That's awesome. And that's a great <laughs> segue because it shows how legitimate that connection is in your life to cars. Yes. It's been a theme throughout, whether you're working in public service and serving the community in BHPD, and then your side hustle as well, yeah. and what you've always been doing around sure. classic cars, refurbishing cars, yeah. uh, creating a marketplace, creating a brand, creating an identity. Um, can you share with us more about sure. how that came about and how you managed to balance life in public service and a full-time job in BHPD and build out your dream? Yeah, I would say that my, my passion for the automotive industry started when I was young, of course, as most kids do um, when it comes to cars. You know, toddlers, 
play with toy cars, Hot Wheels, that kind of thing. And I think just from a very young age, I was always fascinated by the automobile. And as I got older, um, I had, you know, I lived with my grandparents and primarily my mother. We grew up in Huntington Beach, mm -hmm. and so um, I, I attribute a lot of my car culture to my grandparents. Oh. Um, my grandfather was a collector of cars, and um, you know, one of the defining moments in the history of my appreciation for the automobile was when I turned 16. And so I got my first car, of course, at 16. My grandparents had given me my first Ford, which was a 64 uh, Ford Falcon Ranchero. Nice. And, you know, I'm proud to say that to this day I still own the car. Wow. And so it's kind of one of those stories where growing up you hear older car guys say, oh, this was my first car. I wish I never got rid of it. So I've, you know, although the car deserves a little bit of love today, um, I'm glad you know, and happy to say that I still have it so that, you know, at one point down the road, I'll probably refurbish it, um, but hang on to it because it's, it, there's a level of sentimental value that's yeah. attached to something that in, from a marketplace standpoint, may not actually hold a lot of value, but for me, it does. And that's, that's amazing. That's, that's amazing. You know, I, I, there are probably very few of us out there who can say we still have our first car. I mean, I, I feel fortunate to even have pictures of my first car. Sure. So, yeah. But there's, it's certainly a, a great uh, threshold in life, a really defining moment for all of us when we yes. get behind the wheel. And of course, it, it's it's great to hear that you still have that uh, as part of your, your your repertoire. Yeah. Thank you. I, I think to add on that real quick, you know, I think um, something that is a little bit lost in today's culture that that uh, reminds me of when I received my first car is that. There, it's a defining moment because it's a level of freedom mm -hmm. that as a child, you yeah. are a child, yeah. right? You're not an adult yet, and you were given the ability and uh, the uh, you know, opportunity to drive. Yeah. It gives you uh, a level of freedom that you previously didn't have. You, you have the ability to go essentially wherever you'd like um, and explore, whether it's you know, just in your own town or you know, escape yeah. for a weekend from your parents. But I think that that's like it's a, it should be a defining moment in a young person's life. For sure, for sure. The, the combination of the freedom and the responsibility. Yeah. Um, now, you know, here at Datages, obviously, a lot of what we talk about is sort of generational transference of knowledge. Uh, you're talking about generational transference of inspiration. Sure. Um, can you share a little bit more about your grandparents, the influence they had on you, and how it shaped your passion for, for cars? Of course, yeah. My uh, my grandfather Charles was uh, the building director for the city of Huntington Beach. He was a public servant for most of his entire life. So it also shaped your pathway into yes. public service. Yes, it sure did. And yeah. he was a former service uh, member of the army. Wow. Um, so you know, obviously, I, I take a lot of that uh, inspiration into the service that I got into. Mm -hmm. I do have some family history on my uncle's side. Uh, he was a police officer ironically enough, for the city of Huntington Beach as well. Wow. So a lot of my culture and a lot of my, uh, you know, family history comes from Southern California. Yeah, the OC, um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, definitely that surf skate culture that yeah. is that plays a lot into what we'll chat about, about my brand yeah, and, yeah. And, and the clothing and the apparel that we offer is kind Absolutely. of inspirational from that, yeah. from that area. Yeah. But, That's yes, um, related to my grandparents, um, you know, they uh, they really shaped my love for the automobile. Um, I think one of my fondest memories are going to the local car shows on Saturday morning, grabbing a donut, grabbing a coffee, um, and just walking around as a young kid, being mm -hmm. in awe of the beauty of the automobile. Literally yeah. kicking the tires. Yes, literally, yeah, because that's all I could do at that point. Yeah. You know, didn't know anything about collecting cars at that point, just... I liked how Maybe they Hot looked. Wheels. Yes. Yeah. Hot Wheels and, and the smell of uh, gasoline. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah. And it's amazing. You know, they say that smell is the closest sense to the brain and the memory center. Yes. And it's interesting that you say that smell of gasoline. I, I'm sure it's something you hold on to. And oh, for sure. Every day you walk into the auto shop, uh, I'm sure it comes back to you. Oh, yeah. No, for sure. You know, you've obviously over the years, uh, had some amazing car project projects. I've seen some of them. I've heard a few of the stories, um, share with us one or two examples of just really cool, unique vehicles 
uh, that you've worked on and that are your favorite projects? Well, I mean, you know, I think that uh, I've been very fortunate to dabble in like cars from different eras mm -hmm. and also from different cultures and manufacturers. Um, you know, there was a period in my time where I where I got really into the European classics like Mercedes. Mm -hmm. uh, I owned an older Ferrari at one point. Yeah. I learned a little bit about those and what I did and didn't like about those cars and um, but appreciated them all the same. And I would say, you know, as I got older, I started to re-appreciate American classics because at the heart of it, it's my culture. It's, you know, we're American at heart and um, by birth. And so I have learned to appreciate, you know, um, Fords, of course. Mm -hmm. I, I do like Chevys. I know there's people that come into my store and they're like, where's the Chevy stuff? It does exist. It's just not as prevalent. Um, well, but, you and I share the love of Ford. I'm, I'm a Ford <laughs> owner, as you know, so no yeah, argument there. Yeah, and I appreciate that because it's. I think there's a lot to learn from, uh, you know, what we've owned, and especially Fords, like they have a great history. Yeah. Um, but I would say, you know, I really appreciate Fords. I, I think there's a lot of great history with the Mustang. Um, and I, 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 ha I do own a few older Mustangs right now. And so some of the um, history behind why the Mustang was so important um, from a cultural standpoint in America to just the automobile, mm -hmm. I think is what makes it really special. Um, and so having owned a couple very rare Mustangs um, and getting a chance to wrench on them limitedly, yeah. I, I don't want to reveal to the people that I'm not really uh, like a total mechanic. So I, I like the design and the, the right. history. Yeah. yeah, I just, I, I appreciate the style and the history more than, than I can say that I can rebuild an engine. Cause, yeah. but um, yeah, I would say, you know, the Mustang is such a staple car mm -hmm. for America yeah. and um, what, it, what it means to, you know, how it changed um, the sporting of automobiles too. Yeah. Um, just and 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 becoming, and when it was introduced, it, it was such an economically feasible car to attain mm -hmm. for the general public that it was widely appreciated and um, really spoke to the culture of young people at that time. Yeah. Um, so I think it's you know it translates much to today as well. That's awesome. And as you said, while you may not be a grease monkey per se, yeah. you truly are an aficionado. You're an expert. You've established yourself as a resource for so many in the community, including myself. I mean, when I went to buy my 76 Bronco uh, <laughs> out of Pacific Palisades, you were right there with me, you know, yeah. walking around the vehicle, popping the hood, telling me the history of what you saw from the vehicle. You could see the different paint job, different timing when they had done this, this era of engine, this sure. era of every component in the vehicle. Um, you know, I've come to really depend upon you as a resource, and I know many others have as well. And you've obviously been a key fixture in the classic car community. Tell us more about that community. Tell us what that community is like. You talked about, you know, really building your brand around sure. the foundations of that community. Help people who may not be part of that community understand it a little better. Well, to be honest, it's, it is like a family experience. And um, you know, most people think of classic car industry as like a bunch of old dudes that stand around and look at pieces of metal. Yeah, there is some truth to that, yeah. but the reality is it's not necessarily about the car itself. It's about the stories that the cars hold for people, uh, right? It yeah. is, it is the experience behind it and it's the storytelling, yeah. you know, what really drew me and has continued to draw me to the automotive industry uh, is the stories behind the, you know, how these cars hold such a level of importance to people's families or to people as an individual um, is really special. It's, it is a community based around storytelling. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that's what I drew, you know, that, that's what I have, have drawn a lot of my um, inspiration from, of course, for creating Chariots Inc. Yeah. because of this kind of ability to connect with people yeah. um, and the shared passion. You know, what what's, I think is so great about the automotive industry when it, when it comes to collecting cars or to owning a car is that you can own a $30 million car 
or you can own a $3,000 car or a $300 car, and you can appreciate the stories behind um, you know, how somebody acquired something, or yeah. you guys can appreciate just talking about cars, no matter what your income level is, your background, mm-hmm. you know, race, creed, sexuality, whatever. It's like it's it's an opportunity to connect with people yeah. um, over a shared passion, and um, I think that's what makes it so uniquely special. Is that it brings people together, yeah. and no matter what you own or what you quote unquote bring to the table, it's an opportunity to have a shared experience. Yeah, as Americans, we're all part of that driving culture. Yes. So of so, course, uh, I think it's a great symbol of sort of the American dream and yeah. driving our lives ahead and driving our country ahead. Of course. Uh, it's always, we've always been behind the wheel. This is a, a, a good point in time in the, the interview and in our discussion where we'll kind of turn the tables now. I've been asking you the questions. Now, the real point of this discussion is to let you ask the questions. And um, this is sort of your Shark Tank moment. Yeah. Um, why don't you sort of give the pitch to start with? I'm sitting down with you. Sure. I don't know anything about vintage chariots. I don't know anything about your brand. I don't know anything about you or your story. If we were sitting down for the first time, how would you give me the pitch and how would you tell me about the brand? Well, Chariots Inc. and Vintage Chariots, um, and we'll explain the difference between those two later. Sure. It has started from my passion of the automotive industry and having grown up in Southern California in arguably the heart of automotive culture and surf skate culture, um, I just had always dreamed of being able to really provide an interesting product to the automotive industry, but in a way that that was familiar to me. Um, And so starting an apparel company with um, uh, you know, kind of uh, references to the surf skate culture. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I felt that there was a need to introduce a brand that exemplified the automotive and outdoor kind of culture mm-hmm. that not only relied on great style, but also on high quality materials. And I really felt that there was a need for that. Um, having grown up going to car shows, looking at old guys wearing crappy t-shirts with shitty designs, <laughs> you know, they, it, it was really an inspiration for me to provide something different. Yeah. And so Chariots Inc., we are a lifestyle brand mm-hmm. that's uh, kind of centered on the automotive and outdoor spaces and kind of infusing the folks that love automobiles, who love adventure, they love to get out and explore the world. Um, it's an opportunity to express yourself, mm-hmm. but also promote a brand that allows people to be an individual, right? And so what I like about all of that is, uh, and, and it's a great analogy, you're not reinventing the wheel. No. Uh, you're taking a model that has existed, particularly here in Southern California. You talked about that skate culture, that surf culture. You know, you and I grew up in a time period when there were dominant brands that established themselves early on and are now just part of the, the backdrop of, of Southern California sure. that have become ubiquitous. They're everywhere. You see, you see these surf and skate brands everywhere. But it's interesting that sort of that next tier up is the car and particularly the classic car environment. But no one from what I've seen has really grabbed hold of that and created a brand in the same way that it was done for surf and skate. So you're following a model that exists. You're not trying to do something completely new, sure. but you're applying it in a new domain. And what's cool is you're applying it in a domain where there's probably a lot more money floating around. I appreciate that. And I, I think I, I second that because yeah. I would argue that the automotive culture is um, and industry is absolutely massive. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting that no one has really you know, taken a hold of this little, let's call it a niche of apparel, Um, you know, because let's call it what it is. Automotive apparel has existed, you know, but it's generally, if you, if you look around, people who are wearing automotive apparel are wearing typically just shirts and jackets manufactured by already well-known brands that are, that are representing the automotive industry for another product. Like, 
Pennzoil. And so somebody will have a Pennzoil shirt or a jacket. But the impetus to create Chariots Inc. really came from my vision of, hey, well, wait a minute. You know, Hurley and Billabong and Quicksilver, they developed a, a, a brand image around what they loved doing, whether that was surfing or skating, you know, the SoCal culture, the, the, the quintessential SoCal culture. But hey, let's not forget, there's another culture in SoCal that everybody loves, and that's the automotive culture. Yeah. And so for me, I wanted to create something that had the style of what we already enjoyed wearing, but focused on this other element that really wasn't being tapped into um, and making the brand universally mm -hmm. appreciated. So why don't we pick up there uh, in terms of the topics that you really wanted to dive into today? I know one of the areas of focus that you wanted to, to touch on was sort of retail marketing, brand building, all of that. And it, it seems you truly are focused on building a brand and creating that identity. So let's talk about some of the questions you had about that domain. We can get into that first. Yeah, I, I would definitely say that, um, you know, having built something completely and essentially by myself from scratch, there's, you know, there's a level of confusion that comes with that sure. on how to promote yourself yeah. and how to get your name out there and your brand out there to be exposed to the right people, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and get them to understand what the company represents, mm -hmm. what we're doing, why we're doing it, what we're doing now and where we plan to go too. And why not jump on board to, to enjoy this ride with us, right? And so from a retail perspective and a marketing standpoint, you know, my, you know, it, it's, it's definitely been difficult to get our product in the right area, right? And when it comes to the online space, specifically, understanding where we are to benefit most and where our product is to be advertised in a way that appeals to the people that would appreciate who we are mm -hmm. and what we're doing. Um, and, and really, you know, it, it would be great to understand where we need to be placed so that we can be appreciated at the highest level. Okay. So I, I, that's a, it's a really good question. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll preface my response by saying one of the areas in business that I don't consider myself truly expert is marketing. To me, it's there's some science to it, but there's an art to it. Mm -hmm. And to me, there's some mystery to it that I've never been able to pin down perfectly. But I can share the pieces and the lessons that I've learned that I think translate effectively to your brand and many others. Um, one is that you have to maintain consistency. It's that whole, uh, th there's a notion in sales that you have to get your message across seven times sure. before someone actually hears it. And it's kind of a trite notion. It goes back to like the fifties and sixties, even from there of Mad Men and, and marketing from Madison Avenue. Mm -hmm. Um, but I still think it applies today. And the, the, the notion is you have to be on point with your message and you have to deliver the same message over and over and over again. And you have to try to simplify that message as much as you can. Um, one of the things that I've shared with data, just friends and family before is the larger your audience is, the smaller your message needs to be. So if you think that your target market in Southern California, where you're currently present with a physical presence is several hundred thousand people, um, your message needs to be really succinct. It's got to be pick out the two or three bullet points that are most quintessential to your brand and that are so fundamental about who you are and share those same perspectives over and over and over until to you, it's boring. <laughs> yeah. When it's become boring to you, you've probably delivered the message enough that people who aren't intimately familiar with your brand are finally getting it. Sure. So don't be afraid to bore yourself with your message by giving it so many times over and over again. The second piece is that I think that in today's modern age of marketing, there are two things that people are looking for. Um, and they, the, the two things are a person and a story. But what they both are fundamentally rooted in is authenticity. 
whether you're delivering content, whether you're delivering a product, whether you're delivering a service, people want to know the who and they want to know the story behind it. And this is one of the things that I even have struggled balancing within Datages is to me, what's important about what I'm delivering is the content. It's not about Chad Hagel. But at the same time, if I don't put myself out there some to have an association of a person with the brand, in today's world, there's no connection and people won't consume whatever it is, the product, sure. the information, whatever you have to offer. If they don't really know who you are, it doesn't give that authenticity and they won't listen. And then the other part is, as I said, the story. People want to know things contextually. It's not just about delivering a pitch or a message. It's about having a contextual story over time. And I think you have a lot to lean on in that regard. And I think that's part of what you can really share with your target market is that story. And you've told me a little bit, but I want to get into a little bit more and maybe help you process some um, that journey from your background to creating your physical retail presence, vintage chariots, to now what you're sporting on your hat, Chariots Inc., and, and how you're making that transition, how you're telling that story um, to, your, your, to your audience, to your customer base. One of the issues that you know, I constantly think about, I'm always my own worst critic about my brand and my product, right? So you know, I started the company as vintage chariots mm -hmm. because of my passion for the classic automotive industry. Sure. Um, but truthfully, like my, my passion just comes for the automobile. I appreciate new, modern, exotic vehicles as much as I do uh, the old cars, right? You so, don't discriminate. Yeah, exactly. So I appreciate anything that has to do with being on wheels of uh, motion, right? So um, having started the brand under the name Vintage Chariots, mm -hmm. I've had this idea and this kind of motion in place to be more collectively um, recognized as Chariots Inc. And, yeah. and part of the reason for doing so is because there are so many automotive enthusiasts out there that appreciate things other than classic cars. Mm -hmm. And so making this transition has been um, you know, an interesting one because I don't want to on the one side, I don't want to pigeonhole my brand um, into just people thinking that, hey, we only are dealing with classic vintage vehicles and that's all we represent because it's truly not. And expanding the brand image so that we can incorporate a wider breadth of um, people and enthusiasts, you know, people who like modern stuff or stuff from the 90s that aren't quite classics yet. So. A question that I have is, you know, how much can be changed from a branding perspective early on without confusing the customer sure, and sure. being able to retain the same message of who we are, what we do, what we represent and where we're going? Yeah. Yeah. So to go back to the, you know, we talked about the surf culture. I kind of think of it as could old guys rule that brand ever become Billabong? And, and appeal to a broader audience. And I think in that case, the answer would probably be no, but it's primarily because the space is already full. If you have a brand that is a subset of a marketplace and the broader marketplace is already full, then I think you've got a challenge. So I think the key is to make sure that if you transition from vintage to just chariots, that you're still moving into a space that has some vacancy in it. Sure. You can't move into a space where you're competing with somebody that has a brand that is so broadly defined in, uh, across the car culture that you're now competing with somebody that you sure. don't intend to compete with. So I think that's what um, one piece of advice I'd give is to make sure you're moving into a space that's still available. The second thing I would say is that there's this term in business that's become very popularized, a pivot. Uh, people always talk about, oh, we've got to pivot. And I think pivoting strategy happens with more frequency than pivoting a brand because a brand needs to be, we're talking about before, the same message over and over and over again and being very consistent. But that if you do it early enough in the process where your entire market is not yet aware of your brand and you've experimented, you've 
had your, your, your foray into the marketplace, you've come back and learned a lesson from that. And as you get ready to go out again into the marketplace, uh, you want to rebrand. I think you can do that. I think you can do it successfully. The key is to make sure that you're pivoting and not vacillating. Meaning if you're going to change, change and go in that direction completely. Don't confuse people by going back and forth. And then if you're going to make it happen, I think you have to make it happen with a splash. And you have to pick that right moment in time and pick an event or pick a point in the growth of your business where you're ready to hit that hockey stick, as they call it, where sure. you're growing at a slow pace, but you want to reinvest and double down and go big. That's probably the right time to make that transition. I wouldn't try to do it gradually. I would try to make something of it, sure. make it an event, make it something meaningful that sticks with people, resonates and makes an impact when that time comes and, and don't confuse them in the interim. Um, and so I think you definitely have an opportunity to make that change. You're early enough in your business that you can go in that direction. If you follow some of those guidelines to not set yourself up for failure by, by making the change. Sure. I appreciate that very much. I, um, I, I wholeheartedly agree with, with what you've stated there because, you know, I think one thing that we have going for us that we've already put out there is, you know, making this quote unquote pivot from vintage chariots to chariots. Well, chariots has already been a part of our name. Yeah. So we are, you know, making that change would still be recognizable, but it, it would, you know, be that potential change to incorporate a larger audience. Yeah. And I think um, one of the plans that we have for our brand in the next couple of months is our kind of our first real um modeling photography and, and real investment in mm -hmm. our product mm -hmm. um, from a lifestyle perspective. Yeah. So knowing that our, let's call it new marketing material that's going to be coming out here pretty soon is, is already in the works. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, even though that's quote unquote, not a, an, an actual event, you know, utilizing the new name or the revised name at that point will help because it'll work in conjunction with our social media marketing. Yeah. And, you know, we are still small enough to where those who know us would still understand who we are. Yeah. But those who don't know us, who, you know, represent the majority, they're going to be introduced to a brand uh, that's been the same, you yeah. know, from, what, from a quality standpoint and what we represent. Um, so I think that's... That's great. For um, everyone who doesn't already know you, it's new to them. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah, absolutely. There's a, there's a couple of points in there that you said that I think are important. One is you already own the chariot space. Conceptually and literally, you own the yes. domain name you shared yeah. with me. So yes. that's great. Yes. Um, and, and two is you're hitting it at a time when you can make the transition. And again, coming back to storytelling, I think storytelling applies here as well. Why are you changing? Why are you making the pivot? And how do you bring your existing customer base along with you while you embrace a new customer base so they don't feel like they're being swept aside or alienated? And you mentioned you know, marketing channels. And I think this is one of the great strengths of social media is you, it is a great forum to tell a story. You don't have to get someone into the store to tell them that story. Sure. You can broadcast that story and bring people in from the outside who can relate to your story and then drive them to your storefront. Yeah. I, I very much appreciate that because one thing that I've learned really quickly, and as I'm sure you understand, you know, with, with the news of the world lately and this quote unquote retail apocalypse that, you know, we're, we're going through, uh, across the country it's with the understanding that retail is just a component of our brand, right? So I like to say that our stores, although they are important to us and they will forever be potentially important to us, um, they just represent a part of our ecosystem for our brand. So what you're describing is what we in the retail industry refer to as omnichannel. And omnichannel is the future of successful retail. Not all retail will go toward omnichannel, but I think the most successful brands, the most successful retail companies that will survive are the ones that embrace and perfect that omnichannel approach where they are using online sales. They are using social media marketing. They are using a bricks and mortar presence to have a 
direct interaction with their customer base. And your brand is one that lends itself so much to a physical presence where people can come and touch and feel and look and be a part of the, the experience and the culture because everything you have is so visual, uh, so tactile. Like mm -hmm. you just want to touch and grab everything yeah. in the store. You can't do that online. Sure. Um, and maybe you can share, you know, a couple of your thoughts about and your the, the stories about some of the vehicles that you've brought into your your showroom, some of the Fords you've got sitting here yeah. in, in your your environment and what that means to your to your brand as well. Yeah, I think um, you know, when I had the opportunity to start a retail presence of a physical brick and mortar. You know, I had this vision for what that would look like. And being that my history and the history of the brand is rooted in classic car culture, it's a very interesting concept to try to put to life in today's realm because most people's interpretation, I would imagine, of classic car memorabilia is like chintzy. You know, I immediately think... And, and being my own worst critic from a design standpoint, you know, I told myself, well, wait a minute, if I'm gonna build out this store and create a presence, the last thing I want it to look like is like a Ruby's Diner, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or like a- Totally cheese dog. Yeah, or like a yeah. 50s sock hop. Yeah. And unfortunately, a lot of classic car memorabilia does fall under yeah. that category. Um, and so, it being that I was already kind of um, up against the, the odds from a standpoint of, okay, I'm catering potentially to an industry that's dying or is an older industry. How do I use my vision to create something that will appeal to everyone or people living today that appreciate just the automotive culture? So. The, the design of the store plays a huge role in kind of broadcasting the message of the brand, which is like, hey, we're, we're rooted in classic car culture, but we're actually more about modern fashion. Mm -hmm. And how do you convey that message in a storefront and make it look cool, but not cheesy and chintzy? And I think what helps to do that is actually having real authentic artifacts that are desirable from a collector standpoint and or just visually stunning mm -hmm. to create imagery that's that's that will draw somebody into the space and then once they come into the space they understand the quality and the style that we represent because they have an opportunity to touch and feel the product so my initial concept for the store is to infuse a, th a few different elements Having cars in the space was an absolute must for me because most people from a retail perspective aren't expecting to walk by a storefront and see a car. Um, it's a little more prevalent today because Tesla and some of these electrified companies are doing that. Well, it's one thing to walk past the window of Teslas, but you have something pretty unique here. I mean, when you yeah. see the vehicles you've got in your showroom. Oh, I, I appreciate that. And, and really, like, I think it conveys a really cool message and... It obviously is a historical piece and the two cars that I chose for my first location, you know, not only speak to me, but they have real history and they represent real importance in American culture. Mm -hmm. And so the one car that I have featured here in our Valencia store is a 32 Roadster. And I had an opportunity to acquire this. A Ford. It's a Ford, of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. So Chevy people, close your ears, yeah, yeah. you know, walk away from this podcast, turn it off, you know, <laughs> don't come back for a couple of weeks, okay? We, I know you need time to like... Lick you know, your wounds. Yeah, yeah exactly. So um, the, the 32 Roadster is special because it does represent kind of like the pinnacle hot rod from a historical American kind of classic car standpoint. But what makes this particular car very special is that it is an original Henry Ford steel body and frame um, straight out of the factory um, and it's got a lot of great pieces that are appealing to um, you know to the person who comes in and you know I've made an effort for the two cars that are present here to kind of give a little bit of a background 
on the history of each car so they have something to read, something to engage in while they're in my space in addition to you know enjoying what else we have to offer, which includes the apparel, of course, and our photography. Um, the second car, or truck, shall I say, is my 66 F350 crew cab, um, which is a really spectacular piece. A man's truck. Total man's truck. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so this also truly represents like a really cool part of American history. Um, it's a crew cab. It's a four-door pickup truck. These were um, really meant to be nothing more than purely work trucks, um, about as industrial as it gets. They were not intended for civilian use uh, primarily. They would Get the they, whole crew together, get on the job site. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It was literally called a six-man cab uh, for the purpose of getting people out into the fields whether it was uh, forestry industry, the train industry, um, you know, oil industry, of course. And so this truck represents a very rare piece. Um, it is the first full production year from Ford where they started manufacturing four-door pickup trucks in-house and really represents like where American culture has gone. Um, you know, as you see today, some of the most popular vehicles are trucks, yeah. four-door pickup trucks, SUVs. Um, and so it's kind of cool to just have this historical piece here to represent that part of culture. That's and, great. And, you know, we, we've been talking about the store. Um, you know, I know, obviously, me being a real estate guy and being a retail real estate guy, I know some of the topics you wanted to cover today were about Location, location, location. The, the real estate side of things, the bricks and mortar presence. Why don't we get into some of your questions on, on those topics? Yeah, I think one of the most difficult things about retail is, is location, right? Mm -hmm. And getting, you know, you can create this beautiful thing or this beautiful product, mm -hmm. but if you don't have the avenue to showcase that brand or, or what you do to the outside world, then you're probably going to end up dying on the vine. Yeah. So as a small business owner, somebody who has limited funding but a great vision, when it comes to opening a store mm -hmm. with limited resources and you being up against these large companies who have um, you know, unlimited funding, let's call it for the sake of this argument, yeah. to push you out, yeah. How do you, how does somebody like myself address location when funding is so limited that you know our presence may be kind of uh, you know uh, nil? <laughs> of course, of course, I understand. It's a it's a really good question, and you know I'll be candid with you. In this location we're at right now, um, I think you've got some real challenges. Sure. Um, I think that you're in a great mall setting. I think you've got some great co-tenancy here. You guys are unique in that you're somewhat of a hybrid between being a destination where people will seek you out and come to find you, come back to that in a minute, versus depending upon synergy with other retail, activity in the space that brings people to you. Because you don't have a brand that everybody knows, you really are dependent upon being in a place where people will stumble upon you. There's sure. a big stumble upon factor. 100%. Um, and I think where your presence is here today, as I walk around and as I drive around, you know, one of the challenges was I couldn't find you this morning. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. That's a problem. That's yeah. a big problem. If your yeah. customer can't get to you, sure. you can't sell them apparel. Yeah. So I think that uh, that's where some of the online presence comes in. Some of it's about social media, telling your story, pushing yourself more on the spectrum to being a destination because people already know you and they'll come find you. If people are trying to find you, they'll find you. So you have to either create enough impetus within your customer base that they're going to hunt you down and find you no matter how hard you are to find, mm -hmm. or you have to start playing the real estate smarter. Um, you mentioned, and I quickly found out this morning trying to get here, you're not on Google. Sure. Big problem. That's a if you're not problem. on Google, you don't exist. Yeah. So for me to not be able to go on Google Maps and identify precisely where your location is, and sometimes it's not 
automatic. Google's pretty good about sort of scouring all the data that's out there in the universe and pulling out what's important to people, but you can force it too. You can contact Google, you can contact these listing services and make sure that you're accurately, accurately represented in their platform, sure. that they know exactly where you are, exactly what your hours are, have some really good imagery and pictures of your brand. You have to assert yourself in sure. some ways to make sure you can break through the noise and that what's presented is accurate and helpful to your customer base. And that'll help. But then to look at the environment where you are in the center, your landlord is not doing enough for you right now. If they want you to be here and if they want you to be successful, and I think that you can leverage how unique your brand is and the stuff that you have to offer to tell the landlord, look, we're not doing an adequate job of helping me help you. Sure. Because you can actually help them. Your brand is so unique and so strong if you can get it out there that you can improve the environment here at this mall. You can actually have a positive impact not only on your own business, but on everyone else's. Can you coordinate activities with the mall owner to start throwing some of your vehicles for events or for a time period into common areas of the mall? Can you get them out in the parking lot? Can you do a tent show one day where you bring five or ten of your vehicles down here and create a real splash and an event and a, and a, a place for sure. people to come to have something really cool? Can you start tapping into the classic car community and having events here? at the mall where you're bringing people in. If you can start doing these things that are inside outside, meaning it's not just happening in your store, but it's happening in the environment around you, you're gonna demonstrate to the mall owner, to your landlord, that you can have a positive impact on the whole retail ecosystem here. And then they're gonna start thinking about how can we help this guy do even more. Of course. And all, of that, all that's gonna do is build and build and build and build. Um, in, your, in terms of your physical space and where you are, I'm a little concerned because as I look out the windows of your shop, all I see is a blank wall. <laughs> what you're broadcasting your yeah. message to is nobody. Sure. The, you, you need to work with your landlord to probably reposition this location to another vacancy in, in the mall once you've uh, established enough credibility with them where... Uh, hopefully by doing some of these other things I'm talking about, they recognize the value that you bring and it's their idea. Hey, we need to get this guy front and center because he's going to bring people here and he's going to keep people here because he's going to give them something really sticky and tangible and experiential yeah. that's going to bring people back to the mall over and over and over again and bring their friends to the mall over and over and over again. And they should want to move you to better real estate in the mall where your storefront faces the world and faces the customer base to show something that's so beautiful and textual and contextual and tangible that, like I said, brings people back, not only to your store, but to the mall. I think you can have that kind of impact. And I think you need to work with your landlord to create that kind of impact for your benefit and theirs. I appreciate that. We, um, we're seeing a little bit of that at our other location. So, um, you know, one of the kind of positive aspects to our brand is that we have this kind of functional element that we can introduce, um, like the cars, to these events that kind of draw attraction. At our other location in Woodland Hills at the Topanga Mall, mm -hmm. they have a new um, uh, kind of dining hall that they've been promoting as a major facet of, of to draw interest that's opening up here in the next week or two. And they came to us, they invited us to, to use and showcase one of our cars mm -hmm. for the event. So I really like that idea for here. Yeah. Um, but I have a concern that leads, leads me to another part of my question. Sure. Is that considering that we're a small business and that, you know, all of the funding that has gone into building the stores is coming from my own personal capital. Mm -hmm. Having built what I'd like to say is a badass, beautiful store, yeah. and understanding that we may need to move, but getting to the point of convincing the landlord, like, hey, we want better space. Yeah. We want better visibility, yeah. but let's turn the tables. I want to use your dime, not mine. Mm -hmm. And how do you present an effective argument for that um, when they could easily and just as easily say, well, you know what, forget it. We'll just have somebody else who can afford to build, uh, you know, 
their, their space out instead. So how do you bring that level of argument to the table? Sure. It's a good question. And uh, I'll tell you, as a landlord, what we do the other way around is I often say, if you want to make one deal, you better have at least two. I mean, if I want to lease a shop space to a tenant, I better have two tenant prospects in order to create the pressure to get somebody to, to pull the trigger and make the deal happen. Um, you have quite a bit of vacancy around you here in this mall. It's yes. a good mall. It's alive. It's active. There's a lot going on. But I think your concern of get another tenant to occupy that space, if there was another tenant to occupy the better space next door, they'd be there already. Yeah. So you have the leverage. And I'll, I'll take my example of if you want one, you better have two. If you want to cut that deal with the landlord, you should invest your time in going to find another location. Not that you're gonna leave this mall and go to that location, but you need to have a credible threat that you're ready to leave. Sure. They won't want to lose you. Of course. Especially if they've started to recognize the value of your brand and what you can do. And so again, I'd recommend that you not approach them immediately to have that discussion. Get some more traction, get some of these events going, some of these things we're talking about, bring people to the mall, show them the value you can do with, like I said, car shows in the parking lot, showcasing your, uh, your inventory of vehicles, things like that, that they really start to see how valuable you are to the community. Yeah. Then hit them. I, I think that's really important because one of the facets of our branding that we haven't spoke about up to this point is our events. Yeah. We have been to events. We go to large automotive events. And what's so nice about those events for us as a brand is the customer reception because mm -hmm. we're basically force feeding our brand onto a group of people who are going there to attend for a completely different reason, yeah. such as we just finished at the Long Beach Grand Prix. Yeah. We had our largest showing, our most positive reception up to this point, and, it, and having an event, being there, really showcases the brand's potential. And I really like the idea of kind of bringing that, I, you know, that, that whole event space to our retail bring spots. It here. Yeah, bring it here, exactly. create a draw. There's only so much you can do to sell at somebody else's event because there's so much going on and you're a small piece of the story of what's going on there. Yes. Um, and an event of any type is only as good as how you leverage it from there forward. Sure. It's the after event, it's the follow up, it's the customer connection, it's driving that point of sale, getting the sales to occur that really matters for a business. So while you went to the Long Beach Grand Prix, had a great splash, had made a great impact, then what? What yeah, happened then? What did you have to bring them back, bring them here to your store? I would encourage you the next time you have that kind of opportunity, give them a taste. First one's free for you. <laughs> it's the drug dealer approach. Mm -hmm. Give them a taste, but don't give them the whole shebang. Sure invite them then to come to something else where you're going to blow their mind. Sure. And I think that is how you can leverage those kind of events to start getting people into a space that you control in a space where you can sell yes. more effectively Agreed. than you can at a, at a more broad based event. Yeah. And I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. And I think because of the type of brand that we are, we do have a real legitimate opportunity to host something like that. Absolutely. You know, most other apparel brands who don't have this like ancillary connection to mm -hmm. another world don't have that opportunity yeah. other than just popping up a tent and saying, here we are. Yeah. Like we have a unique real opportunity to connect large groups of people over a shared interest. Yeah. And I think that's really, really, uh, important and thank you for that because sure. I think that's really a uh, really good piece of advice. Yeah. And you talked about capital. I think capital is important to any business, particularly a business that's in growth mode. Um, and you talked about the importance of getting your landlords to invest in your physical retail space. As I said, I really think you can do that. Uh, but it is going to take more money to continue to grow your brand. That's sure. not going to stop. You're not at a point right now where 
you're going to be selling enough that you'll generate enough revenue to reinvest in the business to get you to where you want to go. Correct. And, uh, you know, I just, uh, we just finished a series on datages on it takes credit to make money all about startup businesses and, and capital raising. I know you had some, some questions and some topics around that. Uh, maybe we can, can talk about, about those things. And that's where we will pick up in our next episode when we return with Ryan Lawrence. Data just friends and family, thank you for being a part of this ongoing first installment of Entrepreneur's Corner. There's so much to talk about regarding Ryan's business, Chariots Inc. Please join us for the next segment where we will discuss capital raising for early stage small businesses, inventory management in an omni-channel environment, growth of the business, and brand loyalty, among other key topics. And until then, remember, dad may not always know what he's talking about, but he sure can sound like he does.